Hello! Welcome to a little AP World video here. I'm your AP World history teacher, Ben Osborne. Let's talk a little bit about the Silk Road and the Mongols. Everybody loves the Mongols. Um, I guess just because they're so interesting and different, right? Uh, unlike, say, like the Europeans and Chinese and other groups that have like these really powerful empires, but they're also kind of... I don't know, you know, pretty normal, I guess. Uh, the Mongols themselves are pretty wild. Like, they have a really interesting culture and a unique kind of situation. But before we get there, we need to talk about the Silk Road, and we need to talk generally about Unit 2. So, let's check it out, all right? This unit is kind of a bit of a hodgepodge of information uh, due to the addition of the Mongols. So this is really kind of a networks of trade is what this unit is called. So it's going to talk about all these trade networks. But also, it's just kind of like, hey, here's some Mongols. Um, the Mongols do fit in in a big way when it comes to uh, the Silk Road and stuff like that, but by and large, it's not that close, right? Like it doesn't, it's not like another trade network or whatever. So anyway, take it for what you will. Um, again, it's mostly about trade and the networks that are formed by trade. During this period, the increased complexity of civilizations led to trade being more desirable and a lot easier. Um, three major trade networks we're looking at here. Silk Road is what we're looking at uh, today. We'll be doing the Trans-Saharan trade. Um, oh, that's a mistake right there. We'll do Trans-Saharan trade and the Indian Ocean trade in the future. That's a boo-boo, kids. You can mark that down. That's going to be worth some money for the collectors in the future. Um, so why are we doing yellow for unit two? Well, yellow for gold and trade. I guess I could have done like actual gold color or something, but that seems gaudy. Um, also, I like the primaries, um, so we're going to keep it there, right? So uh, yellow for gold and trade. So you You'll see this throughout Unit 2. Uh, we're looking at these uh, pictures, uh, and we'll have this yellow up there for us. All right, let's talk about the Silk Road, ladies and gentlemen. Now, you've probably heard about this before. Um, the Silk Road is used as a vast network of trading routes uh, that connected the east to the west. So primarily, it's uh, Constantinople in Europe to Chang'an in China. Uh, these are the two major cities that are on each side of the uh, Silk Road, but it does go through lots of other locations and places all throughout Asia. There's all kinds of uh, connections that it's going to make. Um, that, that picture over there on the right is the best one I could find when I typed in Silk Road. Um, I think this is supposed to be like in sort of the, the um, western parts of China and or like Central Asia uh, where there are some like deserts and things, though it looks a little too deserty maybe. But it does have the two hump camels, so that probably would be where that is. Um, the Silk Road has almost always been there. So like even back to the Romans and earlier, there's some trade that's going on there, uh, but it increases and decreases depending on what's happening. So in this time period, the 1200, 1450, it's really big, it's really powerful, and it's going on in a big way. Here you can see a little map here for you of sort of the Silk Road in general. You can see uh, all the way over there on the right, you can see the uh, capital of, well, one of the one of the capitals over the years of China, Xi'an. Uh, but all the way over to the other side, then you can see Istanbul or also Constantinople in this period. But lots of little cities along the way, Turpan to Kashgar, Kashgar to Tashkent, etc. One thing to understand is that the Silk Road is not a thing where like one person starts in China and then ends up in Istanbul and has like all the same stuff, right? What typically happens then is like, let's say somebody is in Dunhuang um, and is going to go to Kashgar, right? They're going to transport their goods from one to the other. They'll sell those goods at that next step, right? Somebody will buy them and then that person maybe moves them from Kashgar to Tashkent. And then that person sells them and so forth and so on. So the by the time something gets to Istanbul from China, um, it has been sold and redone multiple times along the way so I just often have this question people are like how do they go all that way and it's like well they don't really I mean like you're not gonna have a whole bunch of Chinese traders or whatever just randomly showing up in Istanbul it just doesn't really happen I'm not saying it didn't happen ever but you know not often all right, um, trade grows during this period. Why? Let's talk about some reasons. First off, Crusades. Uh, so the Knights are going to go to Dar al Islam. So they're going to go to the Middle East, the Holy Land, uh, and then they will want to come. They come back wanting new goods. So like while they're there, uh, they're enjoying new spices and new flavors and. I don't know, uh, textiles and things like that. So when they get back to Europe, they're like, I love that stuff. Let's get it even better. Let's do it again. Um, so that's where all that's going to start to come from. Another thing here is the Mongols. Um, when the Silk Road is under one group, they have a lot better ability to police it. So when the Mongols are really strong, they're going to be able to keep this territory from expanding too much, from getting out of their control, Lots, you know, lot less pirates and less things like that as well. 
Also, uh, we are gonna have some new commercial practices. So one of these is the idea of flying money. This would be credit, basically. It's known by the Chinese as flying money, so you could have like a bank and they would issue script that you could use in the next bank along the way to be able to kind of transport things from one to the other. Another thing here is gonna be caravans, okay? So caravans are groups of people moving from one place to another. So like if you have uh, a camel caravan, you're gonna take all your trade, you're gonna move that trade from um, from uh, one city to the next, but you're not going to go by yourself because that's dangerous. You're going to go together with others. Now, again, this isn't like a brand new practice. It's not like people haven't done it in the past, but this is where they're going to have a lot of people doing it. They're big, massive caravans. Another thing is called a caravanserai. I'm going to go into more detail on that in a second. It's kind of like a trade hotel. I'll show you a picture of one in a second and explain it a little bit better. And then lastly, this thing right above me here that I got banging my wooden head on, my head on, boom, boom. Uh, that is called a camel saddle. Um, again, you think sometimes things are pretty simple, but nobody really develops them until a little bit later on. The thing about the camel saddle here, right, is this middle part is where the hump goes. So you put that over the hump, and then these parts are going to kind of like taper down to the body on the other side, which makes for a nice kind of flat place for somebody to sit and be able to make it um, on these kind of animals. And they kind of you know, do like this too, if you've ever ridden one before. Um, but the camel saddle made it a lot easier for people to ride on them and made it a lot easier to do these kind of transport kind of things that we have going on. Um, here is a picture of a caravanserai. These are pretty important, really. Um, you see them come up a lot on the test and uh, people like talking about them. Um, so basically what this is, again, is kind of like a hotel for travelers. So if you look over there on the left, you'll see like a door, right? It's a nice big door so you can bring all your animals and stuff inside. When you get into that interior courtyard over there on the left, that's where like you could set up a little booth if you wanted to try to sell stuff or maybe people were trying to sell to you along the way. Then you go through the next section, we're going to have a big courtyard in there. That's where you're going to keep your animals. So all your um, camels and others are going to hang around that middle section. they got water there. Um, if you see the little places that are up top, those are going to be a place that you can stay. So your animals would typically stay in the bottom part. You would stay in the top part. Um, and it was protected. They had guards there and stuff to help protect you from being attacked. So you didn't just have to like sit out in the middle of nowhere and be really scared of being attacked all the time. Instead, you could stop in on this caravanserai, which is pretty useful. So yeah, um, some of them still exist, like remnants and stuff, but not a lot. All right, continuing on here, what are the effects of the Silk Road trade? A couple of things. Development of oases and cities. So Samarkand and Kashgar, for example, are two big major trade cities. Uh, the Caravanserai made it much easier to travel, which means that these cities are going to be more powerful. Um, behind me here, you can see a uh, picture of modern-day Samarkand. Uh, this actually, this mosque was built much later. It's the Shirdar Madrasa. Um, that basically means like the House of Learning or whatever. It was an um, educational institution. It's kind of like a university, basically. Uh, this is in modern day. Again, this was probably not built until I think like 1700. It was under the um, Safavids, I think maybe. Um, but long story short, this is not something that you would have seen in 1200, but it's an example of what Samarkand looks like. Um, development of international, of commercial innovations is also super important because of the Silk Road. So banking houses, for example, flying cash we talked about before. There's also this thing in competition with the Silk Road. We're going to have this thing called the Hanseatic League, which will be developed at the time. It's a um, trade network that's in Europe. Let me show you a picture of that. That is the Hanseatic League. You can see the sea trade and stuff going on there as well. People kind of got the idea from the Silk Road and some of the other trade, and they set up these little trading cities to help themselves out in Northern Europe. All right. Let's shift gears over here to the Mongols. This is our 2.2. Um, Mongols are people from Central Asia. Um, not too surprising. Uh, they're gonna. They previously, prior to Genghis Khan, they lived in these clan-based societies, and they're what's called pastoral nomads. They would have animals primarily yaks and horses that they would move from place to place. Uh, they would basically stay in a location that had uh, not as many resources, so they would stay there until those resources were sort of used up, and then they would move to a new location. So you come in, you settle next to a, um, a river for like six months or something like that, maybe three months, and then once the animal you know mess and all that other stuff starts building up once the the game you can't find any more game to hunt or whatever once the grass has been chewed up by the animals uh you pick all your stuff up you put it on the back of the animals and you move to a new location so that's kind of what a pastoral nomad is um they also do a lot of trading with more civilized civilized areas as well one of the problems that they have though is they feud amongst themselves constantly which keeps their power very very weak and that's all going to change so Genghis Khan um, is going to unite the Mongols into the Mongol Empire, or Khanate, in 1206. 
Um, he was born Temujin in 1162, um, and he will use his superior leadership, ruthlessness, and military skills to unite the clans. couple things that he's uh, important about him, he is loyal. Um, he considers loyalty to be one of the most important social traits you can have. Uh, he also uh, has liberal social policies for the time, so things like you know um, independent religion, you can be whatever religion you want, stuff like that, is going to be a bit different from, say, like the Chinese or the European civilization at the time. Um, he has a fascinating life. Like he's born in 1162. Like it says here, his father was an important clan member, uh, like a leader, basically a Khan himself. Uh, and then he's poisoned and killed by a rival clan. Um, so what happens is that Temujin basically gets run out uh, and has to live on his own with his mom and his brother or brothers uh, for a while. Um, he finally is able to, when he gets a little bit older, he's able to survive. He gets a little older and he starts trying to claim back some of that stuff that he had had before. So he's got an interesting sort of earlier life. We don't actually know what he looked like, obviously. Um, they don't really have pictures and stuff. Um, also, he does not, like the Mongols don't really have paintings and stuff. So this picture on the left is actually done way after his time period. So this is a painting that was done of him um, by Chinese artists uh, way after his death. Um, so, I don't know, maybe he looks like this, maybe he doesn't. Uh, but you can kind of get an idea of sort of what he looks like there. Over on the right, we have some modern-day Mongols. You can see his baseball hat uh, riding some ponies around the stab. That would sort of be what their uh, area looks like. Uh, we'll talk more about these horses in just a second. All right. One of the reasons that Mongols were so successful is their military prowess, right? And that has to do a lot with Genghis's reorganization. Um, skill and loyalty were rewarded, not clan or family ties. So, like, if you're related to Genghis Khan, that family tie mattered. Okay, but otherwise, he doesn't really care who your dad is, who your family is, whatever. Can you get the job done? Can you fight, right? It's meritocracy in a sense. Um, so, uh, Mongols themselves are going to have superior horsemanship. They have these unique, small, and hardy horses that help them to expand quickly. That's right, they rode ponies. So, don't think about big old Clydesdales with your Mongols. That's not a good idea. This horse is going to get tired. They got to eat a bunch of food. They need small, hardier horses that are going to help them out. Um, unlike many militaries at the time, they're not obsessed with honor and would sort of happily retreat or use fake strategies against their enemies. So they're all about winning, not about how they look. So there's tons of examples of the Mongols doing fake um, retreats. Like they start to retreat and everyone's like, yeah, we won. And then they just turn around and attack. Um, they also do a lot of things about um, like, uh, yeah, I mean, like they didn't mind having like a few people getting... Um, getting captured or something if they're going to win it in the end or attacking like you know baggage trains or other places like that they don't care they just want to win the battles that's all that matters to them um uh, once they have done a lot of conquests here they're going to have this thing known as the pax mongolica or the peace of the mongols uh it refers to the safety within the empire um after genghis his sons and grandsons will expand that empire which only expands that idea of the pax mongolica a bit so here's an example of the Mongol, or here's a map, I should say, not an example, of the Mongol Empire. Um, so you can see that kind of like dark green is the empire at the death of Genghis Khan in 1227. You can see he conquers a lot of territory. Again, it's kind of desert like and flat, so, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of people that live there, but still, it's impressive. Uh, Mongol Empire at the death of Kublai Khan in 1294, you can see Persia, Russia, China added into it. Over time, then, they're going to, uh, the Mongols, not necessarily Genghis Khan, but the Mongols are going to expand into Song, China and conquer that territory. Uh, they're going to conquer Persia. They're going to conquer uh, large parts of Russia as well. Um, and then you can also see, though, they're going to kind of fragment after a while. And so Kublai Khan, that kind of little boundary there on near Mongolia, that's going to be the territories of Kublai Khan, who is the fourth of the great Khans and the leader of the Yuan dynasty. Uh, that is the dynasty of China. All right, how are they ruling this empire then? Um, so a couple things that the Mongols are doing that are different. Um, they're tolerant of other cultures. Um, and often incorporated their ideas into the empire. So are you a different religion? Don't care. Um, are you loyal to the Mongols? That's what matters, right? Um, so pretty tolerant of other cultures. Let people just kind of be if they surrendered, essentially. So when they come to your town and they're like, hey, we're going to take over your town. And you're like, okay. They're like, all right, great. Here, pay some taxes. We'll all be friends. Uh, but if you didn't, they would, you know, destroy your town, kill everybody, that kind of stuff. So um, kind of weird. Um, also, they're not like beholden to certain things. Like they don't like have a technology for warfare. And they're like, oh, we're not adopting new tech, right? They want whatever helps them get the win. So they learn a lot about like siege warfare, even though that wasn't something they did on the Mongol steppes, and they were able to incorporate that into their army. One example of this is they're going to allow locals into government in Persia, for example. So the Mongols will be at the top, but they're going to let Persians really kind of run a lot of things in that empire. 
Trade is also very important to them. Unlike the Chinese, uh, Confucianism says that trade is not that important. Merchants aren't particularly important classes because uh, Confucius didn't think they like kind of did a whole lot. Um, but the Mongols love trade. They love it a whole lot and are very cosmopolitan. So they're going to try to expand it a lot. Um, merchants will have very high social status within the Mongol Empire. One thing that they do that's unusual is they have a number of anti-Chinese laws. The reason for this is that there's a lot of Chinese and very few Mongols. So when they conquer the Chinese territories and the areas of that, um, they're worried that they're going to be overwhelmed in a sense. And that actually does happen in a lot of places. So, for example, in Persia, uh, they're going to end up converting to Islam. And, you know, by a few hundred years or whatever, they're not really even like recognizably Mongols necessarily. So one thing that they're going to do is they say no intermarriage with ethnic Chinese. Uh, no Chinese are allowed in high-ranking government positions, uh, and they will also end the civil service exams. So while we talk up at the top about tolerance of other cultures, again, it has limitations. They're not, these ain't peaceful hippies, folks, okay? They are instead um, people who are trying to conquer and maintain a territory. And so in that particular case, that would be the way. Um, they're very practical, right? Like that's the most important thing. Um, what do they need to do to win? What do they need to do to expand their culture? How can they handle all this stuff? We'll figure out a way to do it, all right? All right, folks, that's a nice short one. I'm trying to keep this a little bit on the shorter side, so just about 15, 16 minutes there for you. Hopefully that helped out. If you have any questions or anything, always feel free to contact me. Hope you all enjoyed this. Take care. Bye-bye.